Today I'm reading section four of David Hume's Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding. David Hume was one of the preeminent philosophers of the Scottish Enlightenment, along with other thinkers like Adam Smith and James Watt, both of whose most famous works, The Wealth of Nations and The First Modern Steam Engine, they both came out in the same year as Hume died, 1776. Hume was an empiricist philosopher, like many of the others working in Scotland, England, and Ireland in the 1700s. And empiricists believe that all significant knowledge comes from the senses and that pure reason alone, which many continental rationalist philosophers had been relying on, uh, is radically limited. Hume in particular took several very strong views against the possibility of many of the things that philosophers had sought to do. One of his famous lines is, reason is only the slave of the passions. We need feelings, desire, and emotions to tell us what we want and only then reason can start to work out to figure out how to get that, as opposed to philosophers who thought that reason could figure out what our goals ought to be. As he says, reason can't tell us what we should want, or you can't derive an ought from an is. No matter what is the case, that still doesn't settle the question of what ought to be the case. Uh, and furthermore, he goes on to say things like, as we'll see here, uh, you can't derive any sort of general claim from any number of individual observations or from pure thought alone. You just have to make this unsupported generalization. There's no necessary connections, he sees, between distinct existences. One thing can be one way, and another thing can be another way, and your reason alone can never tell you what has to be the case. The world is just one thing after another, and if we think we see patterns in it, we can never be justified in believing that these patterns will continue. As a young man, Hume wrote a very long book, The Treatise on Human Nature, which didn't end up attracting much attention. And soon after this, he applied for a job at a university, which he didn't get partly because of suspicions of atheism. So he took a job as a librarian instead and started working on a multi-volume history of England, which eventually became a very popular text. But during the same period, he was also taking the treatise and revising it and editing it into a much shorter work, The Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding. And this book, which is the one we're looking at here, finally did have the impact on the philosophical world that Hume had hoped. And among other things, Immanuel Kant uh, supposedly credited this book from waking him from his dogmatic slumber, as he put it. And Kant had been working as an astronomer and eventually became one of the most significant philosophers of the era. And of course, Kant was interested in showing the opposite of very many of Hume's doctrines, but seeing certain insights in Hume that he would then want to react to. This section, section four of the uh, inquiry, is where Hume makes his argument that there can be no reason uh, involved in the way that we make scientific generalizations. Instead, he thinks it is mere habit. He's, in a sense, being one of the early psychologists trying to figure out how the human mind does work instead of thinking about how it should work because he thinks there is no should in any of this reason. As he notes, this, uh, this pattern we have of generalizing past things into the future uh, has served us well in the past, but to attempt to say that it will therefore continue to serve us well in the future is to make a circular appeal to this very principle in trying to justify itself. But we'll see that as we get through the text. This version that I'm reading today is one that I found from Hume Texts Online, and I'll link to them in the description below. I'll also give a link to earlymoderntexts.com, which is another site that I really like for work from this era. And they've translated many texts of this period, not just the ones from French and German, but also the ones from early modern English. They've translated them into modern English. And for in many of these cases, they have an audio version, including of this. So you can go there if you'd rather hear this chapter read by someone other than me. Okay, so section four, skeptical doubts concerning the operations of the understanding. So I think by the understanding here, he's meaning the mind or reason more generally. And the skeptical doubts are, he's going to try to show us that uh, there is no good reason for believing a lot of the things that we think we have reason to believe. Part one. All the objects of human reason or inquiry may naturally be derived into two kinds, to wit, relations of ideas 
and matters of fact. And of the first kind are the sciences of geometry, algebra, and arithmetic. And in short, every affirmation, which is either intuitively or demonstratively certain. That is here, he's talking about anything that you can just know by pure reason or insight, uh, what other philosophers might call a priori knowledge or analytic truths. That the square of a hypotenuse is equal to the square of the two sides is a proposition which expresses a relation between these figures. That three times five is equal to the half of 30 expresses a relation between these numbers. Propositions of this kind are discoverable by the mere operation of thought without dependence on what is anywhere existent in the universe. Though there never were a circle or triangle in nature, the truths demonstrated by Euclid would forever return their cert retain their certainty and evidence. And note, uh, this way of putting it, that he's saying all these truths, including the Euclidean geometry, are knowable a priori. This is something that isn't overturned a century and a half later when Albert Einstein convinces us that the geometry of physical space and time is not Euclidean. As Hume notes, geometry in this sense isn't about what the world itself is like. It's about certain concepts and reason alone can't tell us that those concepts exist in the physical world. All it tells us about is how those concepts relate to each other. And if we have an idea of a perfect triangle and yet we can never find a perfect triangle in nature, that's okay. We're still getting the truth about those abstract perfect triangles. Matters of fact, which are the second objects of human reason, are not ascertained in the same manner, nor is our evidence of their truth, however great, of a like nature with the foregone. The contrary of every matter of fact is still possible because it can never imply a contradiction and is conceived by the mind with the same facility and distinctness as if ever so conformable to reality. That the sun will not rise tomorrow is no less intelligible a proposition and implies no more contradiction than the affirmation that it will rise. We should in vain, therefore, attempt to demonstrate its falsehood. And here by demonstrate, he means rigorously prove. Were it demonstratively false, it would imply a contradiction and could never be distinctly conceived by the mind. So here we get another central Humean doctrine, this idea that if you can imagine something, then there is some sense in which that thing is possible. Of course, you have to imagine it at a suitable enough level of detail. But he's think, saying that if you can imagine it, then it's possible. And if it's possible, then you cannot prove that it is false. Uh, all you can ever do is go out into the world and look and try to figure out, is it true or is it false? There is no contradiction in saying, tomorrow will be the first day in history that the sun will not rise. Uh, any pattern can end. And he thinks these matters of fact, these things about how the actual world actually is, these are things that we cannot figure out by pure reason. All we can do by pure reason, he thinks, are these relations of ideas, things like mathematics and perhaps conceptual analysis. It may therefore be a subject worthy of curiosity to inquire what is the nature of that evidence which assures us of any real existence and matter of fact beyond the present testimony of our senses or the records of our memory. That is, think about what you know about the world, that there are places like China and Russia and Ukraine. If you've never been to these places, how do you know they exist? Or consider the future that the sun will rise tomorrow, that summer will come and then winter again after it. All these things that you know, this is not something that you've already seen and or have in your memory or are currently seeing. This is all stuff that we figured out somehow. We have some reason to believe it. And he says, this part of philosophy, this question, how do we know about the things that we don't currently see and haven't already seen in the past? Uh, this part of philosophy, it is observable, has been little cultivated, either by the ancients or the moderns, and therefore our doubts and errors in the prosecution of so important an inquiry may be the more excusable, while we march through such difficult paths without any guide or direction. So this question, how is it that we can know about the future uh, and about things that we haven't seen? Uh, 
This is often called the problem of induction. Hume isn't going to use that word induction in this actual chapter, but it's the modern term that's used. And he claims that this hasn't been investigated much before. So if he's coming to a strange conclusion, and if we think his conclusion is completely wrong, he thinks it's because he's just getting a start on this inquiry. These errors, as he says, may even prove useful by exciting curiosity and destroying that implicit faith and security, which is the bane of all free reasoning and inquiry. The discovery of defects in the common philosophy, if any such there be, will not, I presume, be a discouragement, but rather an incitement, as is usual, to attempt something more full and satisfactory than has yet been proposed to the public. This may even be the passage that woke Kant from his dogmatic slumber, where he wanted to try to show that Hume was wrong, that he'd made some errors, and to try to justify these common sense thoughts that, uh, uh, that we've had about believing things that, uh, about the future or about how the world is in places that we haven't seen. Okay, so all reasonings concerning matter of fact seem to be founded on the relation of cause and effect. So this is Hume's big claim about matters of fact. He thinks anything that we know about matters of fact beyond that which we see right in front of us and that which we have seen right in front of us has to be, he thinks, based on cause and effect. And I think this would be an important premise that we could question. By means of that relation alone, we can go beyond the evidence of our memory and senses. If you were to ask a man why he believes any matter of fact which is absent, for instance, that his friend is in the country or in France, he would give you a reason. And this reason would be some other fact as a letter received from him or the knowledge of his former resolutions and promises. So if my friend sent me a letter, well, maybe let's be clearer. If I opened a letter that says it's from my friend and it says, I'm in France right now, wish you were here. My thought is, a letter like this doesn't come from nowhere. A letter like this has to be caused by something. And the sort of thing that causes it is a person. And the sort of person who writes a letter like this, especially if it matches my friend's style and tone and has my friend's signature on the bottom, well, it's probably my friend. And usually I assume that when he's telling me things in a letter, they're generally pretty accurate, especially if he's reporting about himself. So the way that I use this letter from my friend to figure out that he's in France is by reasoning about cause and effect. I see this letter, I assume what its cause must be. Or he says, the knowledge of his firm, former resolutions and promises. Maybe I haven't received a letter from my friend who says he's in France. Rather, I was talking to my friend last month and my friend said, hey, I'm planning a trip to France sometime soon. And then nowadays I can reason, well, my friend told me he was planning a trip to France. Again, by cause and effect, I can assume the reason he told me is because he actually was planning to do this. And then by cause and effect, I can figure out if he was planning to do this and nothing got in the way, then he probably has gone. So again, it's reasoning about cause and effect. A man finding a watch or any other machine on a desert island would conclude that there had once been men on that island. He's saying, if you see something, and you know that the only way that sort of thing comes about is by people making it, then you assume that someone must have made it and there must have been a person there. And at the time Hume was writing, this particular argument about a watch on a desert island is the sort of argument that uh, uh, many of his contemporaries in Scotland were giving as arguments for the existence of God. They say, observe all these animals around us. They work so beautifully. They look just like machines, like watches. If we found a watch, we assume there would have to be a creator. So if we see an animal, we should assume there must be a creator too. And I think Hume wasn't so happy with that reasoning, but he didn't have a way out of it until a few decades later, after Hume died, Charles Darwin uh, came up with another explanation for how that sort of complexity would arise. But all our reasonings concerning fact are of the same nature. And here it is constantly supposed that there is a connection between the present fact and that which is inferred from it. Were there nothing to bind them together, the inference would be entirely precarious. And this is basically what Hume is going to say. There is nothing binding together a thing at one time and a thing at another time. 
we think there is such a thing as cause and effect. And it's always looked like there was in the past, but he's going to say, we have no reason to continue believing that it will be there in the future. The hearing of an articulate voice and rational discourse in the dark assures us of the presence of some person. Why? Because these are the effects of the human make and fabric and closely connected with it. If we anatomize all the other reasonings of this nature, we shall find that they are founded on the relation of cause and effect, and that this relation is either near or remote, direct or collateral. Heat and light are collateral effects of fire, and the one effect may justly be inferred from the other. That is, if you see the light from a fire, you usually infer that the heat will be there too. And if you feel the heat from a fire, but your eyes are closed, you'll assume that the light is there too. And this is the kind of reasoning that he's calling into question here in this chapter. If we would satisfy ourselves, therefore, concerning the nature of that evidence, which assures us of matters of fact, we must inquire how we arrive at the knowledge of cause and effect. I shall venture to affirm as a general proposition, which admits of no exception, that the knowledge of this relation, that is of cause and effect, is not in any instance attained by reasonings a priori, but arises entirely from experience, when we find that any particular objects are constantly conjoined with each other. Let an object be presented to a man of ever so strong natural reason and abilities, if that object be entirely new to him, he will not be able, by the most accurate examination of its sensible qualities, to discover any of its causes or effects. Adam, though his rational faculties be supposed at the very first entirely perfect, could not have inferred from the fluidity and transparency of water that it would suffocate him, or from the light and warmth of fire that it would consume him. No object ever discovers in this case, discovers, meaning reveals. This is 18th century English, remember. No object ever uncovers by the qualities which appear to the senses, either the causes which produced it or the effects which will arise from it. Nor can our reason, unassisted by experience, ever draw any inference concerning real existence and matter of fact. That is, if you know one thing about an object, you cannot buy that very one thing know about any other thing about that same object unless you have other experiences with objects of this type and assume that the new one is like the old ones similarly pure reason alone can never tell you what any real object must be like you have to just go out and see it or see something like it or maybe not see it but interact with it in some way or hear about it from a person or a book or some other sort of object that you have interacted with before and have learned how reliable it is. This proposition that causes and effects are discoverable not by reason but by experience will readily be admitted with regard to such objects as we remember to have once been altogether unknown to us. That is, if there's a type of object that I remember not having ever seen, then I will understand that. Uh, that what I'm discovering about it is by experience and not by reason alone. Uh, so he says, uh, since we must be conscious of the utter inability which we then lay under of foretelling what would arise from them. So think back to any time that you have first encountered a new type of object that behaved in a way that surprised you. Now maybe you understand how it works, but then it was new. And Hume is going to say, even the ones that are utterly familiar to us, we should realize they work the same way. So here's an example. Present two smooth pieces of marble to a man who has no tincture of natural philosophy, that is, who has never studied science. He will never discover that they will adhere together in such a manner as to require great force to separate them in a direct line, while they make so small a resistance to a lateral pressure. This is a surprising thing. I've never tested this. I bet we could find some YouTube videos. Such events, as bear little analogy to the common course of nature, are also readily confessed to be known only by experience. Nor does any imagine, man imagine that the explosion of gunpowder or the attraction of a lodestone, that is the magnetic pull of a magnet, could ever be discovered by arguments a priori. 
if I show you some powder, if you didn't know it was gunpowder, you'd have no idea this could burn and cause an explosion. If I show you a weird rock, you'd have no idea that this rock can actually attract a piece of metal towards it. Uh, in like manner, when an effect is supposed to depend upon an intricate machinery or secret structure of parts, we make no difficulty in attributing all our knowledge of it to experience. Who will assert that he can give the ultimate reason why milk or bread is proper nourishment for a man, not for a lion or a tiger? So this is an example Hume will come back to several times about how is it that we know that bread is nourishing to humans, but not to tigers. And this is just from experience, he says. Of course, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, we've uncovered a lot. We understand now about carbohydrates and fats and sugars and vitamins and minerals and things like that. But again, I think that can deceive us that all we've got there is we've got more detailed observations of things. I've seen that bread nourishes people and maybe the chemist under a microscope has seen that carbohydrates with carbon and hydrogen and oxygen will undergo certain chemical reactions in the presence of other sorts of things that are in bodies. But again, uh, why does that happen? In the case of why is the bread nourishing, we can say, well, maybe the bread is nourishing because it contains carbohydrates and human bodies have an ability to digest carbohydrates and turn them into uh, nutrients, whereas a tiger does not have the ability to digest carbohydrates and instead needs meat. But that just pushes the question back. Why is it that this combination of acids and proteins will digest this combination of carbon and hydrogen, but not something else? And here, maybe the physicist answers and says, this is because of such and such electromagnetic attraction on the atoms and molecules. But again, that just pushes the question one layer back. Why is it that electrical charges and nuclear forces interact in such and such a way to give rise to this chemical working in this way in this system to give rise to uh, this food nourishing this animal and not that other? All we get is uh, we sort of open the surface and look underneath and see another surface. And so we open that surface and look underneath and see another one. Eventually we get down to these fundamental physical things, but no one claims that they understand why those forces are that way as opposed to some other way. And I think that's the way that we have to keep thinking about this and keep remembering he's in the 18th century, but his questions are still around even though we've given superficial answers to the questions he's asking. The same truth may not appear at first sight to have the same evidence with regard to events which have become familiar to us from our first appearance in the world, which bear a close analogy to the whole course of nature and which are supposed to depend on the simple qualities of objects without any secret structure of parts. We are apt to imagine that we could discover these effects by the mere operation of our reason without experience. We fancy that were we brought all of a sudden into the world, we could at first have inferred that one billiard ball would communicate motion to another upon impulse, and that we needed not to have waited for the event in order to pronounce with certainty concerning it. Such is the influence of custom that where it is strongest, it not only covers our natural ignorance, but even conceals itself and seems not to take place merely because it is found in the highest degree. So here he's th saying, even think about something simple. When one billiard ball bumps into another, we always assume it's going to fly, the second one's going to move away. And in fact, some philosophers like Rene Descartes, who I think Hume is sort of subtweeting here, uh, Descartes thought this idea that one physical object will displace another if it comes into the same place, he thought that that was knowable by pure reason alone and that this should be the solid foundation on which to base physics. But Hume says, even that, we only believe that because we've seen it happen so often. It's not because of pure reason alone. And that's, I think, the thing that makes him very skeptical of any rationalist physics. He thinks you need to do an empiricist physics. You need to observe the world. To convince us that all the laws of nature and all the operations of bodies without exception 
are known only by experience, the following reflections may perhaps suffice. Were any object presented to us, and were we required to pronounce concerning the effect which will result from it without consulting past observation? After what manner, I beseech you, must the mind proceed in this operation? It must invent or imagine some event which it ascribes to the object as its effect. And it is plain that this invention must be entirely arbitrary. The mind can never possibly find the effect in the supposed cause by the most accurate scrutiny and examination. For the effect is totally different from the cause and consequently can never be discovered in it. Motion in the second billiard ball is a quite distinct event from motion in the first, nor is there anything in the one to suggest the smallest hint of the other. Here, maybe he's exaggerating a bit to say that motion in the second billiard ball is completely unlike motion in the first, but I think he's right that nothing about the fact that the one billiard ball is moving should, by its very nature, lead us to think that the other billiard ball will move. A stone or a piece of metal raised into the air and left without any support immediately falls. But to consider the matter a priori, is there anything we discover in this situation which can beget the idea of a downward rather than an upward or any other motion in the stone or metal? I think in this case, uh, maybe if you're the one who's actually lifting the object, maybe you feel it pushing down on you. But again, that's just your experience. It's your past experience telling you that it's been pushing down on you this time, so maybe if you let go, it'll fall. But if you didn't even have that experience, if all you saw was a person move something into a place and then let go, would you immediately think it's going to fall? Some psychologists have actually investigated what do babies think in this sort of situation. And I'll link to some of the work of Elizabeth Spelke and uh, perhaps some others below. And uh, she's done these interesting experiments where she sees if a baby sees an object get lifted and then fall, or if the baby sees the object get lifted and then levitate, which does the baby consider more surprising? Because she assumes babies will stare longer at the thing that they find more surprising. And I think this is the sort of question that Hume is interested in, which is, why do we think this? Is this an innate thought? And if it's an innate thought, is it a justified thought? Or is this something that we just have because of habit? Because we've seen it happen so many times before that we assume it's going to happen in the future. As the first imagination or invention of a particular effect in all natural op op operations is arbitrary, where we consult not experience, so must we also esteem the supposed tie or connection between the cause and effect. That is, just as imagining something uh, is arbitrary. The supposed tie or connection between cause and effect is also arbitrary unless we have experience. We, so we must also esteem the tie between cause and effect, which binds them together and renders it impossible that any other effect could result from the operation of that cause. When I see, for instance, a billiard ball moving in a straight line towards another, even suppose motion in the second ball should by accident be suggested to me as the result of their contact or impulse. May I not conceive that a hundred different events might as well follow from that cause? May not both these balls remain at absolute rest? May not the first ball return in a straight line or leap off from the second in any line or direction? All these suppositions are consistent and conceivable. And in fact, to think about that, imagine what happens if a billiard ball hits a wall. If it hits a wall, you assume the wall stays still and the ball bounces back. But if it hits another ball, you assume the second ball moves and the first one stays still. Why do you assume that if it's not because of your experience with these things? You could have imagined the opposite would happen. That would be at least logically consistent. Nothing in pure reason alone tells you what must happen. Why then should we give the preference to one, which is no more consistent or conceivable than the rest? All our reasonings a priori will never be able to show us any foundation for this preference. In a word then, every effect is a distinct event from its cause. It could not therefore be discovered in the cause and the first invention or conception of it a priori must be entirely arbitrary. And even after it is suggested, the conjunction of it 
with the cause must appear equally arbitrary, since there are always many other effects which, to reason, must seem fully as consistent and natural. In vain, therefore, should we pretend to determine any single event or infer any cause or effect without the assistance of observation and experience. Hence, we may discover the reason why no philosopher who is rational and modest has ever pretended to assign the ultimate cause of any natural operation, or to show distinctly the action of that power which produces any single effect in the universe. So here he's saying, scientists never claim that they've come up with the ultimate explanation. They just say, I've found the pattern that underlies this explanation. And what underlies that pattern? Who knows? It is confessed that the utmost effort of human reason is to reduce the principles productive of natural phenomena to a greater simplicity and to resolve the many particular effects into a few general causes by means of reasonings from analogy, experience, and observation. But as to the causes of these general causes, we should in vain attempt their discovery nor shall we ever be able to satisfy ourselves by any particular explication of them. These ultimate springs and principles are totally shut up from human curiosity and inquiry. Elasticity, gravity, cohesion of parts, communication of motion by impulse. These are probably the ultimate causes and principles which we shall ever discover in nature. And we may esteem ourselves sufficiently happy if by accurate inquiry and reasoning, we can trace up the particular phenomena to or near to these general principles. And that's an interesting list he's given us. Some of those are the things that in fact you learn in an intro physics class. But these days, I think uh, most physicists will say things like elasticity, the way that objects bounce off of each other, the cohesion of parts, why some objects are solid and stick together, the communication of motion by impulse, this sort of, uh, uh, momentum, conservation of momentum. All these things, physicists now claim we have explanations of them in terms of electromagnetism and various other forces. But again, they still have a set of fundamental forces and no further explanation of those. And much of the work of the other sciences is trying to figure out how do biological effects work from chemistry and how do chemical effects work from physics? And how do these physical effects at the scale of atoms work from more fundamental physical forces? But the most perfect philosophy of the natural kind, the most perfect science, only staves off our ignorance a little longer. As, just as, the most perfect philosophy of the moral or metaphysical kind serves only to discover larger portions of it, our ignorance. So his point is, in all these cases, all of our study, it never fully answers the ignorance that we have. It just pushes ignorance further back. Thus, the observation of human blindness and weakness is the result of all philosophy and meets us at every turn in spite of our endeavors to elude or avoid it. Nor is geometry, when taken into the assistance of natural philosophy, ever able to remedy this defect or lead us into the knowledge of ultimate causes by all that accuracy of reason for which it is so justly celebrated. Here again, he's calling out Descartes, who thinks everything can be reduced to geometry and Cartesian geometry is the foundation for all of it. But as Hume says, every part of mixed mathematics, that is every part of the application of geometry or other areas of mathematics to the physical world, proceeds upon the supposition that certain laws are established by nature in her operations. Uh, so, Descartes just assumes that one object will displace another. And from that assumption, together with geometry, he derives all sorts of things. But Newton showed us sometimes objects don't displace each other, sometimes they attract each other via gravity. So Descartes was just wrong about the fundamental forces. He had made a false assumption, which is fine because as Hume says, nothing in reason can tell us what assumptions are true. Abstract reasonings are employed either to assist experience in the discovery of these laws or to determine their influence in particular instances where it depends upon any precise degree of distance and quantity. Thus, it is a law of motion discovered by experience that the momentum or the force of any body in motion is in the compound ratio or proportion of its solid contents and its velocity. 
I think this is actually something from Descartes, which modern scientists have accepted that the mass times velocity is an important quantity and that consequently, even a small force may remove the greatest obstacle or raise the greatest weight if by any contrivance or machinery, we can increase the velocity of that force so as to make it an overmatch for its antagonist. Geometry assists us in the application of this law by giving us the just dimensions of all the parts and figures which can enter into any species of machine. But still, the discovery of the law itself is owing merely to experience, and all the abstract reasonings in the world could never lead us one step towards the knowledge of it. When we reason a priori and consider merely any object or cause as it appears to the mind, independent of all observation, it never could suggest to us the notion of any distinct object such as its effect, much less show us the inseparable and inviolable connection between them. A man must be very sagacious who could discover by reasoning that crystals is the effect of heat and ice of cold without being previously acquainted with the operation of these qualities. Okay, part two. We have not yet attained any tolerable satisfaction with regard to the question first proposed. Each solution still gives rise to a new question as difficult as the foregoing and leads us on to farther inquiries. When it is asked, what is the nature of all our reasonings concerning matter of fact, the proper answer seems to be that they are founded on the relation of cause and effect. When again it is asked, what is the foundation of all our reasonings and conclusions concerning that relation of cause and effect, it may be replied in one word, experience. But if we still carry on our sifting humor in our questioning mood and ask, what is the foundation of all conclusions from experience? This implies a new question, which may be of more difficult solution and explication. Philosophers that give themselves airs of superior wisdom and sufficiency have a hard task when they encounter persons of inquisitive dispositions who push them from every corner to which they retreat and who are sure at last to bring them to some dangerous dilemma. That is, if you just keep asking why, eventually you'll get to a question the philosopher can't answer. The best expedient to prevent this confusion is to be modest in our pretensions and even to discover the difficulty ourselves before it is objected to us. By this means, we make, make a kind of merit of our very ignorance. And this is a point that philosophers have always uh, accepted from Socrates to Descartes and much up to the present. There are some questions we haven't yet answered and any philosopher who claims to have answered every question is fooling themselves. I shall content myself in this section with an easy task and shall pretend only to give a negative answer to the question here proposed. And here pretend is just used in an old sense meaning claim, but you might think I won't pretend to give a positive answer to the question proposed. I say then that even after we have experience of the operations of cause and effect, our conclusions from that experience are not founded on reasoning or any process of the understanding. This answer we must endeavor both to explain and to defend. So that is, he's saying, we reason about matters of fact with cause and effect. Cause and effect we know from experience, but how do we know about cause and effect from experience? Well, he's going to say, there is no good reason for justifying this. This is just a habit of the human mind. He's proposing, this is a question for psychology because philosophy can only tell us the answer. There is no good reason. We can just understand what are the tendencies of the human mind and not uh, why should we trust them. It must certainly be allowed that nature has kept us at a great distance from all her secrets and has afforded us only the knowledge of a few superficial qualities of objects while she conceals from us those powers and principles on which the influence of those objects entirely depends. Our senses inform us of the color, weight, and consistency of bread, but neither sense nor reason can ever inform us of those qualities which fit it for the nourishment and support of a human body. As I mentioned earlier, in the century and a half after Hume, sense and reason were able to figure out how to build microscopes and how to do all sorts of detailed experiments on the digestive tracts of various animals. But that still hasn't put us all the way down to the level of 
fully understanding why bread nourishes. It just tells us bread nourishes because it has carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are nutritious because they undergo certain chemical reactions. Those chemical reactions under, uh, happen because of certain relations of masses and charges. But why do masses and charges behave like that? That's just how the laws are. We have no understanding of the powers behind fundamental physics. Sight or feeling conveys an idea of the actual motion of bodies, but as to that wonderful force or power which would carry on a moving body forever in a continued change of place, inertia, and which bodies never lose but by communicating it to others. Of this, we cannot form the most distinct, the di most distant conception. But notwithstanding this ignorance of natural powers, and here is footnote, the word power is used here in a loose and popular sense, the more accurate explication of it would give additional evidence to this argument. But here he's just thinking, whatever the fundamental causes of things are, these natural powers, even if we don't know what these natural powers and principles are, we always presume when we see like sensible qualities that they have like secret powers and expect that effects similar to those which we have experienced will follow from them. If a body of like color and consistency with that bread which we have formerly eaten be presented to us, we make no scruple of repeating the experiment and foresee with certainty like nourishment and support. And I don't know if any of you saw this meme from mid 2020 of everything is cake. And I think it's someone who just keeps cutting into objects and they turn out to be amazingly designed cakes that look like shoes or plants or toilet paper rolls or other things like that. And uh, I think what's so disturbing about that is that it violates this assumption. We see something that looks just like a roll of toilet paper and yet it doesn't behave like toilet paper, it behaves like cake. And that is undermining exactly this tendency that Hume sees. Now, this is a process of the mind or thought of which I would willingly know the foundation. It is allowed on all hands that there is no known connection between the sensible qualities and the secret powers. And consequently, that the mind is not led to form such a conclusion concerning their constant and regular conjunction by anything which it knows of their nature. That is, how do I know that another food that looks the same as the food I've eaten in the past will taste just as good? Just from experience. It's not because the look of pad thai tells me what pad thai will taste like, or that the look of a cake or of bread or of anything else tells me what it'll taste like, except in so far as it looks like other things that I've tasted before, and I assume a connection between looks and tastes. As to past experience, it can be allowed to give direct and certain information of those precise objects only and that precise period of time which fell under its cognizance. But why this experience should be extended to future times and to other objects, which for art we know may be only in appearance similar, this is the main question on which I would insist. The bread which I formerly ate nourished me. That is a body of such sensible qualities that with that shape and color and smell was at that time endued with such secret powers. It fed me, I wasn't hungry anymore. But does it follow that other bread or things that look like bread and smell like bread must also nourish me at another time? And that like sensible qualities must always be attended with like secret powers? The consequence seems no wise necessary. Remember, everything is cake. <laughs> it, uh, it could always turn out to be a cake. At least it must be acknowledged that there is here a consequence drawn by the mind, that there's a certain step taken, a process of thought and of inference, which wants to be explained. These two propositions are far from being the same. I have found that such an object has always been attended with such an effect, and I foresee that other objects which are in appearance similar will be attended with similar effects. I shall allow, if you please, that the one proposition may justly be inferred from the other. I know, in fact, that it always is inferred. Humans always make this judgment. But if you insist that the inference is made by a chain of reasoning, I desire you to produce that reasoning. The connection between these propositions is not intuitive. And here, it is intuitive in the sense that we use the word intuitive and that it's perfectly familiar. 
but in the way he's using the word intuitive, it is not something that is logically necessary, immediately obvious, and would lead to a contradiction if it were denied. There is required a medium, that is some intermediate step in the reasoning, which may enable the mind to draw such an inference, if indeed it be drawn by reasoning and argument. What that medium is, that intermediate step, I must confess, passes my comprehension. And it is incumbent on those to produce it who assert that it really exists and is the origin of all our conclusions concerning matters of fact. This negative argument must certainly in process of time become altogether convincing if many penetrating and able philosophers shall turn their inquiries this way and no one be ever able to discover any connecting proposition or intermediate step which supports the understanding of this conclusion. But as the question is yet new, Every reader may not trust so far to his own penetration as to conclude, because an argument escapes his inquiry that therefore it does not really exist. For this reason, it may be requisite to venture upon a more difficult task and enumerate all the branches of human knowledge, endeavor to show that none of them can afford such an argument. And so this is what he's going to do. He's going to consider all the ways we have of knowing things, and show that none of them can produce this justification of induction, justification of the belief that a future thing will be like a past thing that resembles it in some ways. All reasonings may be divided into two kinds, namely demonstrative reasoning or, or that concerning relations of ideas and moral reason or that concerning matters of fact and existence. So remember, this is how he opened the chapter at the beginning. There's two kinds of propositions the ones that are abstract about relations of ideas like mathematics, and the ones that are concrete about matters of fact. And now he says, there are two types of reasoning, one for each of these types of proposition. And for the relations of ideas, all we have are deductive reasoning that give conclusive proof. And for matters of fact, he says, all we have is cause and effect. So that there are no demonstrative arguments in this case seems evident since it implies no contradiction that the course of nature may change and that an object seemingly like those which we have experienced may be attended with different or contrary effects. May I not clearly and distinctly conceive that a body falling from the clouds and which in all other respects resembles snow has yet the taste of salt or feeling of fire? I can imagine that. Is there any more intelligible proposition than to affirm that all the trees will flourish in December and January and decay in May and June? Of course, Hume writing in the middle of the 1700s will be aware that British people had been going to Australia now for almost 15 years. And in Australia, of course, the seasons are reversed. So of course, that's totally consistent. Even if all the way up until the 1700s, no one in Europe had ever seen summer in December and January and winter in May and June, still it's possible. Now, whatever is intelligible and can be distinctly conceived implies no contradiction and can never be proved false by any demonstrative argument or abstract reasoning a priori. So this is the same thing he said at the beginning, that if you can imagine it, then it must be possible and you cannot prove that it is false. You can only observe and see that it never seems to happen and then how do you know that it doesn't ever happen? If we be therefore engaged by arguments to put trust in past experience and make it the standard of our future judgment, these arguments must be probable only or such as regard matter of fact and real existence according to the division above mentioned. But that there is no argument of this kind must appear if our explication of that species of reasoning be admitted as solid and satisfactory. We have said, that all arguments concerning existence are founded on the relation of cause and effect, that our knowledge of that relation is derived entirely from experience, and that all our experimental or experiential conclusions proceed upon the supposition that the future will be conformable to the past. To endeavor, therefore, the proof of this last supposition by probable arguments or arguments requiring existence must evidently be going in a circle and taking that for granted, which is the very point in question. So yeah, that paragraph, this one paragraph is the most important paragraph in this entire chapter, I think. He says, all knowledge is two kinds. There's deductive reasoning about relations of ideas and there's empirical 
uh, reasoning about matters of fact. The reasoning about matters of fact proceeds by assuming that the past and the future resemble each other, that things I haven't yet seen can be assumed to be like the ones that I have. And then he asks, how do we justify that assumption? Well, I can't justify it deductively because it's totally possible that this could fail in any one case. And in fact, it does fail all the time as the everything is cake meme shows. But uh, if we try to prove it the other way, then we're trying to use this very principle to prove itself. And that would be circular. So he thinks it cannot be justified in any way. In reality, all arguments from experience are founded on the similarity which we discover among natural objects and by which we are induced to expect effects similar to those which we have found to follow from such objects. And though none but a fool or madman will ever pretend to dispute the authority of experience or to reject that great guide of human life, it may surely be allowed to a philosopher to have so much curiosity at least as to examine the principle of human nature which gives this mighty authority to experience and makes us draw advantage from that similarity which nature has produced among different objects. For from causes which appear similar, we expect similar effects. This is the sum of all of our experimental conclusions. Now, it seems evident that if this conclusion were formed by reason, it would be as perfect at first and upon one instance as after ever so long a course of experience. That is reason, if you just give it the one start, it should be able to get a perfect conclusion. And yet our reasoning about experience is not like this. The case is far otherwise. Nothing so similar as eggs, yet no one on account of this appearing similarity expects the same taste and relish in all of them. It's only after a long course of uniform experiments in any kind that we attain a firm reliance and security with regard to a particular event. I think he might also be thinking about eggs because eggs look identical, but before refrigeration, a good percentage of the time, eggs would turn out to be rotten. And you can't tell that from the outside. And so eggs would be an example where people were very familiar with the fact that just because it looks similar doesn't guarantee that it's going to be the same. And yet we've developed a long course of habit with eggs. And now we know there's only a few ways that they end up being. But again, it's a long course of habit that's needed, not just one observation. And yet pure reason seems like it should only require one or even zero observations. Now, where is that process of reasoning, which from one instance draws a conclusion so different from that which infers from a hundred instances that are no wise different from that single one? This question I propose as much for the sake of information as with an intention of raising difficulties. I cannot find, I cannot imagine any such reasoning but I keep my mind still open to instruction if anyone will vouchsafe to bestow it upon me. And here I think is where a lot of 19th century statistics comes in. But again, statistics is all founded on the assumption that there are patterns, that there are commonalities, that there are probabilities and trends. And if we assume that there are, then multiple observations can tell us what there must be. But Hume's point is, how do we even get the assumption that there are such patterns? Should it be said that from a number of uniform experiments, we infer a connection between the sensible qualities and the secret powers? This, I must confess, seems the same difficulty couched in different terms. The question still recurs on what process of argument this inference is founded. Where is the medium, the interposing ideas which join propositions so very wide of each other? It is confessed that the color, consistency, and other sensible qualities of bread appear not of themselves to have any connection with the secret powers of nourishment and support. For otherwise, we could infer these secret powers from the first appearance of these sensible qualities without the aid of experience, contrary to the sentiment of all philosophers and contrary to plain matter of fact. That is, the smell and look and texture of bread does not tell you that it's nutritious. And Anyone who claims otherwise is just relying on their experience and their experience tells you this, but the properties themselves do not. Here then is our natural state of ignorance with regard to the powers and influence of all objects. How is this remedied by experience? 
it only shows us a number of uniform effects resulting from certain objects and teaches us that those particular objects at that particular time were, were endowed with such powers and forces. When a new object endowed with similar sensible qualities is produced, we expect similar powers and forces and look for a like effect. From a body of like color and consistency with bread, we expect like nourishment and support. But this surely is a step or progress of the mind which wants to be explained. When a man says, I have found in all past instances, such sensible qualities conjoined with such secret powers. And when he says, similar sensible qualities will always be conjoined with similar secret powers. He is not guilty of a tautology. These propositions are not in any respect the same. You say that the one proposition is an inference from the other, but you must confess that the inference is not intuitive, as in logically immediate. Neither it is demonstrative. Of what nature is it then? To say it is experimental is begging the question. For all inferences from experience suppose as their foundation that the future will resemble the past and that similar powers will be conjoined with similar sensible qualities. If there be any suspicion that the course of nature may change and that the past may be no rule for the future, then all experience becomes useless and can give rise to no inference or conclusion. It is impossible, therefore, that any arguments from experience can prove this resemblance of the past to the future since all these arguments are founded on the supposition of that resemblance. Let the course of things be allowed hitherto ever so regular. That alone, without some new argument or inference, proves not that for the future it will continue so. The rule of induction has worked well so far, but how do I know that it'll continue to work? That is the rule of induction. In vain do you pretend to have learned the nature of bodies from your past experience. Their secret nature and consequently all their effects and influence may change without any change in their sensible qualities. This happens sometimes and with regard to some objects. Why may it not happen always and with regard to all objects? What logic, what process of argument secures you against this supposition? My practice, you say, refutes my doubts. And here he means, look at me. I'm a person, I'm writing, I'm publishing a book. Why am I doing that if I think that the future won't be like the past? I'm publishing a book because I know in the past, people who publish books often end up getting read and becoming famous and getting rich and people like them. And maybe that's the reason why I'm doing this. But, and so therefore you think, you don't really doubt that the future resembles the past, but you mistake the purport of my question. As an agent, I am quite satisfied in the point. But as a philosopher who has some share of curiosity, I will not say skepticism. I want to learn the foundation of this inference. No reading, no inquiry has yet been able to remove my difficulty or give me satisfaction in a matter of such importance. Can I do better than propose the difficulty to the public, even though perhaps I have small hopes of obtaining a solution? We shall at least by this means be sensible of our ignorance if we do not augment our knowledge. I must confess that a man is guilty of unpardonable arrogance who concludes because an argument has escaped his own investigation that therefore it does not really exist. I must also confess that though all the learned for several ages should have employed themselves in fruitless search upon any subject, it may still perhaps be rash to conclude positively that the subject must therefore pass all human comprehension. Even though we examine all the sources of our knowledge and conclude them unfit for such a subject, there may still remain a suspicion that the enumeration is not complete or the examination not accurate. But with regard to the present subject, there are some considerations which seem to remove all this accusation of arrogance or suspicion of mistake. And this last paragraph is, I think, his other main argument. It is certain that the most ignorant and stupid peasants, nay infants, nay even brute beasts improve by experience and learn the qualities of natural objects by observing the effects which result from them. When a child has felt the sensation of pain from touching the flame of a candle, he will be careful not to put his hand near any candle, but will expect a similar effect from a cause, which is similar in its sensible qualities and appearance. If you assert, therefore, that the understanding of the child is led to this conclusion by any process of argument or ratiocination, I may justly require you to produce that argument, nor have you any pretense to refuse so equitable a demand. 
you cannot say that the argument is abstruse and may possibly escape your inquiry, since you confess that it's obvious to the capacity of a mere infant. If you hesitate there for a moment, or if after reflection you produce any intricate or profound argument, you in a manner give up the question and confess that it is not reasoning which engages us to suppose the, the past resembling the future and to expect similar effects from causes which are to appearance similar. This is the proposition which I intended to enforce in the present section. If I be right, I pretend not to have made any mighty discovery. And if I be wrong, I must acknowledge myself to be indeed a very backward scholar, since I cannot now discover an argument which it seems was perfectly familiar to me long before I was out of my cradle. That is, his point is, first, he's given this argument, this dilemma that says, either it's a, everything's either relations of ideas or matters of fact, relations of ideas can't prove induction, and matters of fact rely on induction, so therefore they can't prove induction. He seems to say there can't be any argument. And then he says, well, what if there is some argument that's just too complex to have come up in my catalog, that it's too subtle and too refined? Well, he says, if there is such a subtle and refined argument, that doesn't really matter because that subtle and refined argument isn't what we have been relying on. Since we've been learning from experience since we were babies, animals do it. And if babies and animals do it, then it can't be because of some deep and subtle complex reason. Instead, his point is, this is just a mere psychological habit that all of us have. This is part of our psychology, but it is not part of logic. There is no reason to believe that the future will be like the past. We just do. It has served us well so far, but again, that doesn't give us a reason to believe that it will continue to serve us well. It just means that we will assume it will continue to serve as well. 